Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button and then tickle that notification bell to make sure that it's on because I post videos on a daily basis. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below in the description box. Real quick announcement here. Guys, whenever you comment, please don't put the chapter marker um, a bunch of times in your comments because what that does is flag it as spam and I have to delete it. So I know that I might talk not as fast as you would like, but trust me, I eventually get there. I'm not a fast talker when it comes to these stories because it's helping people sleep. Also, if you use a lot of uh, symbols instead of emojis, it flags your comments as spam. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And if I don't delete it after a certain amount of time, YouTube does. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, we're tucking and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads placed in this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. I wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Park. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it up for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I see what looks like hundreds of little small eyes, and they're being brightened with a light darting around. Then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They look just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these are producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon gathered around my truck. It seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early in the evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the light and looking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched him until I fell asleep at around 1 a.m. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the brand new truck. There wasn't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if it's relevant info, but I thought I would add it in there anyway. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes my hair stand up on the back of my neck. The house I'm leaving since I was eight is horribly haunted. I apologize if there's any spelling mistakes. English isn't my native tongue. So, I start with a little background of the property. This house was built somewhere in the middle of 1800. It has belonged to my family since the beginning. My great-great-grandparents built it from scratch when they moved from Italy to Uruguay 
the backyard accompanied an entire block, so it was pretty big. During the years, the family began to sell parts, so it is now one-fourth of what it was then. The house served as many things. A cinema, two churches, a bar, a cladestine abortion center, and many stores. Sadly, a lot of people have died here, including murders, natural deaths, and suicide. The previous owners, some family friends, said that the last nights they spent here were absolutely unbearable. Doors and windows would open and close alone so fast, they had to get out as fast as they could. And all of the neighbors always told us that they could hear babies crying in the backyard, where they used to bury fetuses. Cousins of my mother had seen people in the bathroom's mirror plenty of times. Smells would appear out of nowhere. A pretty messed up place. We moved in 2010, and almost immediately things started to happen. Stuff would be missing from the place where we left it. We could hear conversations in a different language in the backyard at night. But after searching, there was no one there. But the thing that creeped the hell out of us were the apparitions. A few months after moving in, my brother woke up in the middle of the night, only to find out there was a man at the end of her bed with black plastic bags covering his head. She didn't scream nor wake me up, just closed her eyes and prayed until she fell asleep. Now, this became a regular thing. We could see different people at any time in the house, and they would vanish into thin air. I remember once where I went to a sleepover at my cousin's house. That was the same as ours, but was divided by a wall. And when I woke up at 12 p.m., I saw a woman watching me from behind a full-blown body mirror. I couldn't move, so I closed my eyes. She wasn't there anymore, but had moved to the bedroom door. I closed my eyes again, and she was gone. I have many, many stories like this. Even once we discovered a picture that no one took in my cousin's. It appeared to be a baby from the other time. You could see by its clothes. It was the final proof that there was something going on in here. So, after contacting a medium, she told us that six different persons were living in the house with us. I could tell you like 30 different things that happened here since then. Right now, we got used to this and just live with the knowledge that they aren't going anywhere and it was their home first. But still... We felt like prisoners in our own home. Hey there, just for a little background real quick. I was with my girlfriend in England on a little getaway with my parents. Also to point out, even though I'm 17, I definitely look younger. I am 5 foot 4 roughly, and due to that, I occasionally get misaged by different people. I think this should be known for later on in the story. Also, I wear a swimming top when I go in any swimming pool because I get anxious. Me and my girlfriend decided it would be cool for us to go for a swim in the pool within the hotel. It was nothing super big or super small. And luckily, there was only one other guy doing laps in the pool. Nothing was remotely strange in the slightest. This is an inside pool, for the record. I put down our towels and the key to our locker on a chair and got on in. About five minutes later, an older man, probably 40 or 50, entered the room in a small pink bikini. Obviously, it is a bit odd to see and very uncommon. However, I don't actually have a real issue with it. Each to their own, I guess. What got weird is when he entered. Me and my girlfriend kept very much to ourselves, minimal eye contact with anyone else in the pool, and we didn't speak. However, the guy came over to us almost immediately and said, hey. Out of kindness, we both say hi back and smiled. 
normal stuff. He would swim around the area of us and make eye contact specifically with me repeatedly. I felt beyond uncomfortable as I wanted a relaxed swim with my girlfriend. He continuously swam in our area until he made the comment about how he hopes I don't mind that he wears ladies' clothes as he is gay. Yes, he looked me in the eyes and said that. I felt slightly awkward because he was in a bikini. Not that there's anything wrong with that. However, I couldn't help but notice he was looking at me often. I was growing more and more uncomfortable, however. I didn't want to be a nuisance and make my girlfriend get out of the pool because of it. Nothing much really happened while in the pool itself onwards. From that point, as we didn't move around much, pretty much hovering in one spot, talking with me slightly nervous. He went and spoke to the other guy swimming for a while, but kept peeking at me while doing so. To be honest, I think the other guy just wanted to swim and didn't care what he was talking about. However, after that chat, he then got out. As the guy got out of the pool, he went and laid down on the chair, next to the one we had our towels on. I don't know if he specifically chose that one as he could clearly see it was ours, as two towels were there. It could be excused as a coincidence. However, once my girlfriend walked away and I was grabbing my towel, he decided to ask in specific tone about why I wear my swimming top. This gave me incredible vibes of him flirting in a way, asking me why I wouldn't take my shirt off when I swam. I was stumped and answered with, Because sunburn? Keep in mind, we are at an inside pool. I also just said it felt more comfortable because I realized we were inside and I probably looked beyond stupid. He smiled at me and said, Ah, okay, or something along those lines. He then looked at me and said, I think you would look better without one. This made my heart race, and I was ready to go. I was shocked he even had the guts to say that to me, so I just laughed it off and said bye. I feel like it was incredibly inappropriate to even ask a child why he was wearing swimming tops let alone already have made it known that you are gay and you like wearing ladies' clothes, and then state, I would look better topless. Sir, I have been mistaken as a 12-year-old child in the last year. I have a deeper voice, and if you knew my age, I'm sure you could realize I am truly 17. But initially, a lot of people think I'm younger than my age. I managed to escape and get dry and get changed in the changing rooms without him coming in at all, thank God. If he did, I would know it's on site. But yeah, that's my weird little story. I'm really interested in hearing some opinions about how you feel about the situation. If you think it was completely normal or... If it seemed like there was weird intent. Although I understand it's different when you are in the situation, as you can properly understand emotion and intent with someone rather than being told it. I want to start off by saying I'm one of the oldest siblings in my family, and my parents got divorced a few years back. My mom is one of the strongest women I know. After the divorce, she found someone that was loving and treated us like a family should be treated. She met up with him at an event, and it seemed they were soulmates. At first... I thought they were meant to be and perfect for each other. At first, I thought they were meant to be and perfect for each other. He has been so supportive of her and great to my younger siblings. As one of the older siblings, I brought it upon myself 
to do some research on the guy, just to make sure there wasn't any red flags. After looking into it, I found an account with a picture suspiciously looking just like him. After finding this, I brought it to everyone's attention. The account was a sexual account linked to him. I couldn't believe it, and brought it up to my mom just to be pushed away. A couple of months went by just like normal, and we all kind of forgot. Recently, I decided to look up the username on other cities such as Reddit, and I was shocked. What I found was unsolicited pictures of my mom posted for meetups. He was a completely different person than what we knew. He was sneaking illicit pictures of my mom online to meet up with other people. Of course, when I found this out, I showed my siblings. With all this proof, we brought it up to my mom, sobbing, you have to leave him. At first, she was on board and blocked him. More and more came out about the person he truly is. My mom started to distance herself from him. She confronted him, and of course he denied, until he said he would kill himself. Soon after, she left town, and he found out where she was staying and called her hotel phone all night long. In these phone calls, he was yelling, Answer the phone, bitch. I know you're there. Why are you ignoring me? As the phone calls were falling on deaf ears, he decided to act on it. At 6 a.m., I got a call from my sibling to check the blink cameras at my house. He decided the best way to handle the situation was to come to my house and to act crazy and scream into the cameras while playing creepy music. At 1 a.m., he ended up stealing the cameras and saying he was just going to throw the cameras into the river. Of course, I woke up extremely concerned and immediately thought, he messed with our family dog. Thankfully, he didn't and just took the cameras. I proceeded to call the police and get them back while she was out of town. The cop said he did seem off and to be a serious threat to my mom, and she should get a restraining order. After this event, he called my mom and gaslighted her. He came to her and said he's been blacking out, different personality, and can't remember events. Sadly, she took his side and believed him. He went on to say he didn't remember posting her without her consent and that he has another personality. She completely believed him and wanted to help as she thought he really was mentally unwell. His devious gaslighting plans had worked. There's no way he is telling the truth as in the post, he mentions my girl, suggests that we were together. I'm scared he is going to hurt us. I don't know how to get rid of this guy. I'm terrified. They will be getting married soon. So if you know anything or could lend me some wise words, any suggestions will truly help. Ever since I started living at this house, where things have happened, it regularly sounds like someone is walking on the outside of the house at night and it's starting to freak me and my roommates out. For some context, this is a college house, four girls in our 20s just looking for a fun place to live. There had been a few different encounters that have led us to this conclusion, and it only continues to fall into place. Let's go back to this summer when the first break-in was even happening in September, in the middle of the week. The garage door. The garage has never been used by us other than for storage. Opened, and one of us was at home with music blasting. She heard it and didn't think anything of it, but about five minutes later, went upstairs to check and found our parking garage open and back door unlocked. Again, we do not use our garage. 
She looked around and found nothing missing and figured it was an accident. About a month later, we were having a party. It was around Halloween, and we decided to have a costume party. Around 12 to 1 in the morning, someone was in our backyard and turned to see a man walking up the side of our house. When the man saw him, he ran away and up the hill. We also, around this time, had found one of our car windows broken. Nothing was stolen, just the window had broke. Last night, while driving around, we noticed a car we had seen by a few times and followed it up the hill. The man in this car, a middle-aged white man, a very receding hairline, and arms covered in tattoos, comes to a complete stop in the middle of the street and turns around to look at us, then pulls to the side of the road. He waited there for a few minutes, and we waited one street over. We saw him turn left and followed him into the neighborhood in front of us. We lost sight of him and drove around the neighborhood just a bit longer. When driving in front of our house, we were wondering if anyone behind could see into our rooms and went to look in the street behind. The house that had direct view into my room happened to have this same car that was driving around our house sitting right in front of it. This car is very distinct. It's an old white sedan with a black shoe mark on the rear bumper. We immediately went back into our house and looked out the window at the same house and realized we had seen someone there before. One minute, separate occasions, there was a middle-aged man standing in the window looking at our house or sitting on the back porch in a lawn chair facing our house. Last night, when we went to bed, my roommate had heard her window open and heard footsteps. Our fence gate open and car doors. The footsteps sounded like they were directly outside her window, and I also heard them. Normally, I wouldn't jump to conclusions, but I feel like these occurrences just connect too well to be coincidental. If anyone has any ideas or input, please let me know. We are genuinely getting really scared. I will update if anything else should happen. Oh, yes. Here's an update. Yesterday morning, my roommate and I woke up to find that it had snowed and there were shoe prints outside. These clearly showed the path the person is taking, and it is exactly what we've been thinking. The footprints appear to start in the neighbor's yard at the fence and then come down to the gate right next to our rooms. He walked directly under my roommate's window and turned around, his back was to the house, which is why we think he is either listening or watching in our windows. The window he was sitting under also just happens to look right up into my roommate's bed, if not closed right. After that, the footprints go towards my room, and he turns back to the neighbor's path on the side of their house. This just confirms what we've already been thinking, and it just so happens to be the side we don't have a camera on. With this, our gate and footsteps situated from last month makes perfect sense. The shoe prints are huge, which fits perfectly with a tall man, like the one we've seen before, and you can tell the shoe is Nike. If I can figure out how to attach a photo on here, I will, but until then, I can only explain just how terrified we are. No matter what his intentions are, this is a huge man, and he could take all of us down. Another update for March. The white car just turned out to be what we're pretty sure is a neighborhood dealer, because... We saw him make a transaction with our neighbor. We honestly don't live in a sketch area. This is the first time we've seen something like that. And here's your last update. I am tired of trying to prove my situation, and most of the comments 
have been negative and degrading. I would like to thank everyone for their advice and assistance, but I will no longer be updating this. So, if you have any more suggestions, please let me know. This happened when I was about 12 or 13 years of age. During this time, my brother was diagnosed with cancer. And so, my mom was often at the hospital with him. She would randomly come home during the day to do laundry, pick up stuff, eat, etc. At this time, my mother, brother, and I were also living at my grandparents' house. My grandparents have a two-story house with a basement. There is the front door and then to the left of the staircase leading downstairs. The basement had two bedrooms, a living room, and a bathroom. When you enter the basement, you were immediately in the living room, which is where my mom slept. Then you go down the hall and find a room halfway down the hall, across from the bathroom, and my brother's room is at the end of the hall. Sorry for the context. Anyways, one day I was extremely ill and stayed home sick. Both of my grandparents were at work, and my mother was at the hospital with my brother. I was laying in bed, sleeping, when I was awoken by really loud stomping coming from upstairs. I assumed it was my mom just coming home to get some stuff and was pissed she was running around like a lunatic. I sat up in bed to go upstairs and yell at her. But when I sat up, it felt like my brain had a heart attack and was beating against my skull. So... I just laid back down and went to sleep. I am not sure if this next part actually happened or if I just think it did because I was delusional from a fever. I swear I kept hearing someone coming downstairs. Our stairs are quite noisy. At the time, I slept with my TV on, so I think the person or people kept hearing the TV and got freaked out. So... I'd say maybe half an hour to an hour later, I wake up, forgetting the whole thing happened, and I call my mom. She tells me to go upstairs and get some Dayquil to help me feel better. So, I open the door leading upstairs, and it's just freezing. So, I stop for a moment and think, that's weird. So, immediately ran back downstairs and tried calling my mom, who, of course, didn't answer. So, I call my grandma instead, and she tells me I need to call the police. I call the police, and they tell me to go wait in the driveway. So, I do. And, of course, as soon as the cop and I are talking, the school bus taking all the people I went to school with passed right by my house. As soon as my grandma got home, she gave me the biggest hug, and I just lost it. I think it was the first time since I pieced it all together I finally felt safe again. They ended up taking a portable DVD player, a Canon camera, and worst of all, all of my great-grandmother's jewelry that had just passed away. I often think about what would have happened if I would have gone upstairs, and I don't think it would have been anything good. So... Guy or people who broke into my house, let's not meet. This happened about 15 years ago. So my buddies and I went fishing at a pretty remote lake off a 4x4 trail about two hours from home. There were four of us all men, with me being the smallest at 195 pounds. That'll be important later. The camping spot has great fishing, as it has a nice deep spot with lots of trout right next to it, but the campground itself is rough. It is on the side of the steep hill with barely enough room for tents and a small fire ring. It is accessible by a rough steep winding a hundred yard trail 
from where you would park your 4x4 above the camp. We had a great day, drinking beers and catching our limits on nice-sized trout. After it got dark, we made a small fire and just bullshitted the night away. It was a great time. Suddenly, there was something shining, a blinding light into our eyes from about 10 to 20 yards away. We didn't hear this person approach at all. This person announced themselves as the sheriff. One of my friends asked, Are you a, the county's name, sheriff? The stranger didn't respond to the question. Instead, he shined a light in each of our faces, then said, Have a good night. Then, walked off. We sat there dumbfounded, asking each other what in the hell just happened. After a minute or two, curiosity eventually got the better of me. So I lit up this person with my stupidly powerful flashlight. He was about 50 to 60 yards away at this point, right before a crest and bend of the trail, right before he was out of sight. We all saw it. It was just some dude in a flannel shirt and jeans. I said, That is not a fucking sheriff. He must have heard me as you could see him start moving quickly for a second before he was out of sight. A few moments later, we heard an engine start, and that was that. Strange we didn't hear the vehicle earlier, but I attribute that to being drunk and loud. Now, what makes this kind of scary is what if it wasn't four big dudes he approached? What if it was a single person or a couple? What would he intend to do? Should we have chased after this person? Debatable. Should we have reported this to the actual sheriff's department? Absolutely. But sadly, we never did. And this remains one of the creepiest experiences I have ever, ever had. I was on a solo trip several years back and had fancied that I could make an 18-hour drive in one go. I was wrong and started to pass out at the wheel, so I decided I needed to nap somewhere. The closest thing for many miles was a little gas station set off a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Just dark landscape as far as you can see and some truckers ahead and behind on the road. There was one car at the station that I assumed belonged to the clerk. I parked where I was still illuminated by the station lights, but away from the main parking spaces so that no one would reasonably need to pull up next to me. I set an alarm for 45 minutes, and I figured I'd see how I felt then. I woke suddenly and glanced at my watch, and about 20 minutes had passed. Then, I glanced out of my driver's side window and found myself making eye contact with a man. A truck had pulled up about a space away from my car. There were no passengers, and the trucker was on his passenger side of the truck with his front and back passenger window open. He had a long chain in his hand and seemed to have been pulling it from the back of his truck while watching me sleep. A second after we made eye contact, he froze and stood still as he stared right at me. Then he began to quickly pull at the chain and take a step towards my window while not breaking eye contact. My keys were still in the ignition, so I made a hasty exit. As I pulled away, I looked into my rearview mirror, and the man had moved to the back of his truck and rested his forearms on it as he watched me drive off. I can't prove he was doing anything malicious, but... There wasn't a need for him to park right next to me when I'd parked out of the way. He didn't need to watch me sleep or make intense eye contact. Don't need to step towards my window. Not sure 
what was happening with that chain because there was nothing in his truck bed visible or around this truck that would have called for a chain. Definitely didn't need to stop what he was doing and watch me drive away. I'm still pretty jarred from this experience, but I figured it would be easier to share about than keep dwelling on it, so forgive me if it's a little wordy. A couple of days ago, someone broke into my house while I was asleep. I work night shifts, so sleeping during the day is something you learn to get used to. Around 6.30 p.m., I heard what I thought was a loud knocking sound coming from outside, and my dogs were going absolutely ballistic. For reference, I live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. My closest neighbor is a half mile away, but back to the story. I somewhat wake up, but didn't really think anything of it since my neighbors like to shoot their guns, and this was during hunting season. As I start falling back asleep, my heart started fluttering weird, like I knew something just wasn't right. That's when I heard two loud footsteps throughout the house. My dogs are still barking, but start to quieten down. That's when I really begin to worry. When I think my dogs would protect me in a time like this, <laughs> fat chance. <laughs> The footsteps stop on the other side of my bedroom door and doesn't move. I think this is how I'm going to die. And although I had a weapon in my hand, I knew I couldn't get it without being heard. It felt like an eternity before the steps moved around and towards my brother's room. Rustling can be heard loudly through the house and things being thrown. I knew they were in my brother's room. Some of his friends are in a seedy situation, and I knew it had to be one of them. I heard the footsteps come back to my door, and the doorknob handle moves. I immediately turned my back towards the door and closed my eyes shut, a hand over my mouth to stop from screaming. The door opens, but that's it. Then he leaves a car and then drives down the road. I finally bucked up my courage and got the hell out of bed. Everything in the house except for my brother's room was undisturbed. I immediately called my brother and asked if any of his friends were coming over. He said not that he knew of, and I told him what happened. He got off the phone with me to start calling around. I went back to bed and noticed that I still had my window cracked over from earlier and realized I had my sheet off of me as well, wearing only a t-shirt to bed. If it was who I thought it was, this wasn't a random event. One of my brother's friends has always had eyes for me, and the fact that he saw me sleeping and in just a t-shirt makes me freak out. Whether or not he took something out of my brother's room or knew I was home alone, sleeping before I had to go to work later that night, I don't know. I'll post an update when I hear from my brother. You move out to the country to get away from the activity of city life and let your guard down. That's when something like this happens. Sometimes country life isn't so safe after all. Here's a quick update. I am sorry for the late update. It's been a crazy week, but thank you for bearing with me. My brother got back with me with news I absolutely dreaded hearing. None of his friends said or claimed to have been at the house at the time of the incident. So now I'm even more afraid of who was in my house and what their intentions were. They could have been scoping out my house during the day. Now that my county has decided to extend the gravel on my road that connects to the farm community I live near. 
I just hope I don't have another visit like that anytime soon. But if there's a next time, I'll be sure to be ready for them. Jerome, Arizona Experience. So I would like to talk about truly the experience that got me fully believing in the paranormal. First off, I would like to mention that over the years, I've gone through many tacky and purely tourist ghost towns and tours. But when I arrived in Jerome, Arizona, it just felt different from the start. Now, Jerome is a quaint little mountaintop town in Arizona, partially isolated from a fair amount of the area, and is part of an old amount of tragedies, ranging from nine cave-ins and massive TB outbreaks. I had heard about this place by a friend who lives in the area and eventually plans to stay via Airbnb with a nice older couple during my visit to visit the friend that told me about this place. When I arrived, I was very surprised at just how quiet the town actually was, besides the bars. Everyone just seemed in harmony with the history of the town. Beforehand, I had made arrangements to go on a ghost tour, a pair of old local guides, a father and son, who just happened to live in an old cathedral to show me around the town in some of the more popular haunted spots. We begun the tour with myself and a young couple also staying in town for the night. As I started talking to them, the guides that is, I learned how much about the town and their personal experiences throughout the years. Stories told of homeless men who had been dead for decades and nuns who pushed the older man out of the guides down a set of stairs when he first moved into the church. We visited the usual spots, old mines and abandoned hospital building, turned into stores and finally an old coffee shop that used to be a very popular bar and eventually speakeasy. This was the town that changed my view on the paranormal. As we walked in, I immediately felt different. It was said that some man still resided here that died during the Prohibition era, and he would sometimes know or interact with people if he found them worth his time. In the shop, there was also a single couch that remained from the era that was said he would sometimes sit and relax upon with others. Anyway, as I said, I felt different. I could tell the guides could too at this point. So, we got settled in and started asking simple questions. After a while, we started to get a response. Slight knocks on the door to the bathroom and the walls. We all thought it may have been a coincidence or just a hoax pulled by the uh, guides, if you will. The noise would keep getting louder. This was when we saw the apparition of the lower part of the man's legs. Let's just say the young couple was terrified and immediately left with the older guide leaving me and the younger guide alone in the room. He sat on the chairs across from me while I sat on the couch and asked questions. It wasn't truly that I had my experience until I ended up asking the ghost. I asked if he still remained here, waiting for a woman. No response. Knowing that in the past that Jerome was a gay haven back in the early 1900s, I then ask, then are you still waiting for a man? I then felt the couch creak as if the someone else had sat down and felt pressure on the back of my neck. 
This was all accompanied by a loud knock on the wall behind me. We promptly left after that, but making sure we thanked the ghost for his time at the door. Even though it wasn't that terrifying, it will always live in my head as what convinced me of the paranormal. If anyone else has had experience like this or ever been to Jerome, I would love to hear your stories as well. I've been debating with myself for months whether I should post this for you all or not. And today I finally feel like it really is time. It's a long one, so please have patience with me. And yes, I need to tell people about this and need someone that knows about this to talk to. I lived on a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell there was something wrong. I felt uneasy there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and slept on a wooden storage storage in the house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance. And in front of it, there was an open, empty field with one of the outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house to the left and then the forest. Now, in the foreign's entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that out here to mark something, and right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something in there. I moved there with four dogs, plus the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was wake up at 5 a.m. to go to the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on the way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night. I dismissed it as the wind. Cliché, I know. And it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still at the first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything, so I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Then, some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. Slightly moved things and kept being a general creep. Whatever, I flashed a light on it and it disappeared, but the eerie feeling kept there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, I started falling asleep on some days. And in those days, I woke up with headaches and the feeling my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through our forest. This is important because of the next part. Then, one day, 
My aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said the place had gold buried in it for some fucking reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before. She decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. I was digging it. I need to describe what happened now very well to pass the feeling. So bear with me. There is a certain level of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned this that day as I dug that hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rock, I hit something soft and resistant that felt just like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. It immediately, after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape I tried to break through it, since my aunt insisted it was a protection for the gold and my parents were just whipping me into helping her. But it was no use. And it occupied most of the area of the hole, so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt then said she would cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop, and even the flashlight wasn't working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything pressuring me. My door wouldn't close. Things would make noise, and the thing would be there, staring at me. Now, the part that makes the security camera important. They stopped working the moment it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window, and one pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage, and all the cameras had stopped working except for the one pointing towards the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, they never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep because of fear, but it never actually showed up, and things just got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about that even now, four years later. It was just too real, and there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about the thing we hit while digging, and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if we found a body or some haunted thing that was hidden. Oh yeah, here's some extra stuff I forgot to mention. I kept some events out of it because it got too long. So if you want, I can tell them here in the comments. There was the time the dogs were crying all night and were desperate to enter the house the next morning. There's more to it. This is just a shortened version. There was the time I got my notebook thrown at me, again, on a shorter version there. There was the time it left physical marks on my wall, and even my mother commented on it. This one and the notebook are big reasons why this experience is so serious to me. Then, there was the time I left my window open to see what was tapping on it. I suspected there was something more than the apparition. And I couldn't sleep for two days after that. I had a very strange walking trail encounter with an invisible, two-legged, very large thing while walking with my dog. 
Some of the trail sections have wooded areas along the walking paths. So most of the trail was woods on one side of the path, and the park is on the other side of the trail. The wooded area is not very large. I would guess maybe 300 feet by half of a mile. So I don't consider it a forest. I just call it the woods. The wooded area of the park has three or four small creeks, and I think only of one of the creeks has some water. Most of the trees here are beautiful and normally tall trees. And some of the trees here and there look like they were dead. There are always people and kids going down there to ride bikes, hang out, and whatever else they do. One day, around 4 p.m., I took my female dog, Bertha, for our normal everyday walk. We had just gotten out of the car and began our walk. We were probably walking on the trail for about five minutes or so when I started feeling weird after a turn. No, not scared or afraid. I started to feel happy and my little pains and aches had disappeared. This was very strange because I remember saying to myself inside my head, not out loud, but I said, wow, I feel good. I feel like a little kid. I feel brand new. It was only about 20 seconds of this young and joyful feeling when all of a sudden, something had let go of a large bush that it was holding on to. The thing sounded like it was intertwined in the bush, like holding on and trying to hide. At the same time of the noise in the bush, Bertha turned towards the bush and started going after it. I had Bertha on a leash, and she was dragging me, almost taking me into the woods. I had to hold her back because I couldn't see what was making all that noise. It moved through another tall bush and started stepping heavy with loud thuds. I think it fell when it made its way out of the bush area. The thing was only about 15 foot away from us on the other side of the bushes and sounded like two very large horses stomping on the ground. I could see the bushes and the grass moving, but I could not see anything else. We moved back away from the trail a few feet so I could see a clearing on the other side of the bushes to try and see if I could see this thing. I looked around where the sounds were coming from and found nothing. So I looked down on the ground, and I could see where two feet were stepping on the tall grass. I remember I said to myself in my head, No way. This is not an invisible monster. After I said that, I heard something like I will never forget. The thing started making loud T-Rex stomps. Then I said out loud, that sounds like T-Rex from the movies, I recall. I could feel the stomps on the ground. Bertha and I were just looking into the woods at the sound. I could feel my eardrums shaking badly, and both my eardrums felt like they were busted speakers. In my head, I said, it's trying to blow my eardrums. The T-Rex stomps lasted about 10 or 15 seconds. Then the sound stopped. It just turned off like a light switch. I have no idea if it jumped into something or if it just vanished. It is strange because after all, that I still felt happy with no worry or fear at all. Just very curious. I really wanted to see what it was. On the way home, I remember thinking, any other day, I would have been afraid and ran away from it. I heard this thing three or four times in the following days. In another section of woods, I could hear someone heavy walking on leaves just inside the tree line. Maybe about 30 feet away in the woods alongside me and Bertha. I would hear it and I would stop 
without turning to it. And it would take a step or two, and it would stop. I turned around a few times to see nothing, because it was not moving. I did this a few times to make sure. I would tell myself in my head, if a person stays on trail, they have no permission to take you. I think one time, I heard his steps in the woods next to me. I said to myself in my head, I think it wants me to make a mistake and go into the woods after it. After I said that, I never heard it again. I am sure it can hear what I am thinking. Just a few weeks ago, I saw something very strange related to this thing. Bertha and I were walking in the same part of the trail, only about 150 feet away from my first encounter where the bushes were. I stopped to look into the woods, at this view into the woods. I was standing still, looking past the trees, how the area was covered in a few inches of light green grass. I was looking kind of downhill, how the woods go down in, and around the creek down there. I said to myself, it looks beautiful. The trees, the color of the greens and the sunlight and shadow. It looks like a postcard perfect. And about two or three seconds after I thought that, while I was just looking down at this area of woods, I saw a big human shaped blur moving between two trees at about 50 feet away. I saw it for a split second. It was big. Maybe ten feet tall, big head, big wide muscle shoulders. And I remember his big left leg. I remember his left knee and big muscle above it. The laterals. I could see the thick shiny hair on the leg. Yes, this thing looked exactly like the predator from the movie. When he is cloaked. It is very weird how my brain was able to capture this image. My memory surprised me. His shoulders, his head, and the side of his back were reflecting the woods between him and me. It looked like a male, not a female. I was surprised, just like him. In my opinion, I think he took off running because he thought I was sensing that he was in the area. But... I had no idea he was there. I think he knows Bertha. Can't pick up on him if he hides a little further away from the trail. I am very cautious when we go walking near woods now. I also tell people where I am going and carry a few things hidden on me. I have no idea why this thing got so close to me or what its intentions were. But I also don't know why it ran away from me those times. Was there something or someone behind me that startled it? These occurrences were a very incredible time of my life. It changed me in a way. I often think I don't know, but maybe that's why dogs are on this planet to help us and pick up on these invisible things when they get too close. Always be happy and do the things you love during your life. Have no worries and certainly no fear. I hope my story helps people to be alert and careful out there in this chaotic world. This happened about one year ago during the summer. Something you should keep in mind is that the house I had lived in had one acre of land surrounding the house. Where I had lived was near farmland. I had woken up at around eight in the morning on my living room couch, having fallen asleep the previous night, as well as my mother and sister who were sleeping beside me. I had planned to watch this movie I hadn't finished the previous night on my laptop as well as eat breakfast in the dining room of my house. I had sat down at the end of the dining table 
which was the closest chair to the kitchen. Keep in mind, if I leaned back in my chair, I could see onto the further side of the kitchen, where the door that led to the deck was, which had this huge window right next to the door. So, I turned on the movie and started to eat my breakfast as my dog trotted over to me and sitting right next to me. I believe I was about 45 minutes into the movie when my dog had switched her spot, now sitting right under the archway that led to the kitchen, staring at God knows what. I felt her move, but I didn't really think anything of it. If it was serious, she would have been barking like hell. About 10 to 20 minutes go by, and I glance over at my dog, noticing she's still staring at something. This time, I heard shuffling or scratching over the kitchen. I called out her name, but she just wouldn't move. So when I had to walk over to her, I followed her trail of vision and noticed that she was staring at the window in the kitchen that leads to the deck of the house. I nearly shit myself when I saw something or somebody behind the window outside, peeping through the blinds. I forgot to mention there was a chair on the deck, right under the specific window. So, whatever the hell that was, had to have been balancing on the chair to look inside. It looked bald, almost, if that makes sense. And white with pinkish tone. It had been holding onto the window frame, peering at my dog and I, while scratching the screen on the window with his horrible, heavy breathing. I remember thinking in the moment it was a person trying to break in, because whatever it was wanted to get in so desperately the thing was sort of small, and it seemed as if it didn't want me to see the rest of its face, only its eyes. The whole time my dog had been watching whatever that thing was and not barking. I'm saying this because something as simple as dropping a cup will send my dog into a fit, barking like crazy. Even a voice coming from the TV could cause a great couple of minutes of barking from her. Now, as I said, I believed someone was trying to get in, so I ran over to the couch into the living room, shaking my mother awake and bringing her to the kitchen. And of course, whatever the hell that was had simply disappeared. I would have thought I was losing my mind if my dog hadn't had been there seeing the same old thing. I peered out another window, checking the driveway in case it was a person. And they had drove a car here, but there was nothing of the sort. My mother went out onto the deck and looked around, but there was nothing there, except fingerprints on the window frame. We checked around the whole yard, and nothing was found except for the prints. I'm quite traumatized to this day, knowing that whatever it was that had been watching me for quite a while, and I didn't know it, and also the fact that if it was a person, it would take a while to get off the land. Even if they tried running away, we still could have caught him. Because, you know, the huge yard. I'm not living in the house where this had happened anymore, thankfully. I've had other scary experiences in that house, but those are stories for yet another day. This happened in March of 2011, near my house in a small town about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was in the 8th grade at the time, and it was during my spring break. That year, instead of sunshine and warm weather for spring break, there was a snowstorm, probably around 8 inches or so of snow. My two friends, my two younger brothers and I, decided to make the best of it and just go play in the snow for the day. 
There was a woods near my house, not a huge woods, but big enough to hike around in for, you know, a few hours. So we decided to do just that. About an hour into the hike, we stumbled upon what looked like an old well, a stone circle about 10 feet in diameter, about four feet high off the ground, and partially filled with a foul-smelling, half-frozen water. We threw a few rocks into it and stuck long tree branches into it to try and find out how deep it was. We tried with a branch that was at least 20 feet long, but, but we were unable to hit the bottom, so it was pretty deep. Now, the well by itself wasn't really creepy or anything, but how old it looked and the way it was just stuck out in the middle of the woods was a little unnerving. The part that really terrified us came about 20 minutes after discovering the well. We had decided that we are done messing around with the well and had just started to continue on into the woods. While we all heard something that made us freeze dead in our tracks with fear. Echoing through the woods came a loud shrieking laugh. It was a high-pitched, grating voice that was still very loud despite seeming like it came from somewhere far away. We all just froze for a moment, trying to make sense of what had happened and what we had just heard. The laugh came again, this time distinctly closer to us, but still not in our immediate vicinity. At this moment, none of us saying a word, we bolted back the same way we came, away from the sound in the direction of the house. We didn't stop running for what seemed like forever, and we eventually made it back to my house without any more incident. None of us had a clue as to what we had just heard and none of us were ever brave enough to go back out there to try and find it out. I would love to hear any thoughts about what it could have been, paranormal or otherwise. Also, I apologize if the part about the well was irrelevant or unrelated, but I thought that it possibly could have been another clue as to what it was we heard. But again, this is very, very much real and I personally experienced it and would love to know about any potential theories that could explain it. Thank you for listening to my story. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but this one popped up in my brain the other day. And I've been thinking about it a lot and can't really explain what happened, so I thought I'd share. About two years ago, in the dead winter, my power went out. This was a big problem for me because I have a pet leopard gecko who requires heating elements to survive. It started getting very cold in my apartment very quickly to the point I became worried about my pet's safety and did the only thing I could think to do, which was take my gecko to my car and crank the heater up. Normally, we get a few power outages every winter in my area, and they last maybe an hour or two. This time was different because the power did not come back on for six hours. After about an hour sitting in my driveway, I got extremely bored and started driving around my neighborhood, which had some more rural areas that butted up against National Forest. One of these areas is an absolutely beautiful overlook where you can see miles of the forest and also a few streetlights. So I'd be able to see if the power came back on. So I drove there and parked to enjoy the view. I had the heat running for a while, and the car had gotten a little bit hot, so I rode down the window to let in some cool air 
and almost immediately started hearing something kind of far off at first. Kind of a weird, sad-sounding owl mixed with a squawk. I assumed this was an animal, but rolled up the window, almost all the way, just in case. Over the next twenty minutes, the sound got progressively closer and closer to the car, until it sounded like it was circling me. I can still hear this sound in my mind, clear as day, even though this happened several years ago, and I know what animals we had locally and what they all sounded like. This didn't sound like any of them. I got nervous and decided to leave and go get some food and gas in a neighboring town that still had power. About another hour passes, and there's still no power. Having convinced myself the sound was just an animal, and it had probably long since moved on, I went back to the overlook to enjoy my meal. About another hour goes by without anything happening. No noise, no nothing. Until eventually, I see movement along the big rocks in front of me. It started to get dark, so, so I can't really make it out perfectly, but at one point, it looked like the head of a disfigured animal peered at me over the rock and then disappeared. I see this several more times, but I stay because if it was an animal, there was something severely wrong with it, be it an injury or a birth defect that would probably affect its quality of life, and I wanted to be able to let animal control know so they could find it, help it, and put it out of its misery if necessary, since it was clearly staying in that exact area. After a while, it starts making noise again. The same one as before, but now it's also added this horrible gurgling and sounds almost human. At this point, it's gotten completely dark, and I can't see much of anything, but I can still hear it circling the car. Eventually, I hear what sounds like something messing around near the back tire and I panic and peel out of the parking spot. I look behind me and see what is now very clearly a person in the taillights. They attempted to chase the car for a few feet, but quickly gave up. Is it possible this was just a person under the influence or suffering from a mental health issue? Yeah, uh, it definitely is, but that's still seemed pretty unlikely since it was probably below 30 degrees outside and far enough out of someone's way. I doubt anyone would be hanging out there, let alone hanging out there for hours and wearing what appeared to be an animal skin on their head. If it wasn't a person based on the location and how the thing looked, probably a skinwalker, I would say. This experience still terrifies me to this day. I believe I may have a recording of the sound that I will try to find. If I can't find it, I will post it. But due to the power outage, I didn't film any or record most of the experience to conserve my already dying phone. Hello, I have a new one I finally decided to write out. Sorry for the formatting or any of my grammar, as English is not my mother tongue. This happened maybe some months ago, precisely on the 5th of November. I lived in northern Italy, so that was the evening in which the red aurora borealis appeared visible for us. I was chilling at home after a long day, when one of my friends calls me and asks me if I wanted to try to see the aurora with him. I said sure, because I'm always up to an adventure, and from where I live, the top of the mountain is circa one hour in the car. At 2130-ish, 
he comes and gets me, and we go up. We even see a cute, chunky fox while ascending. We arrive at the top of the mountain. There's a big parking lot there. And when we get out of the car, pretty freezing, howling winds. We encountered only one car in the road, and one is parked at a distance from us, apparently empty or just dark. We take some pictures. Can't really see the aura, but just some reddish specks of light here and there. It was still magical. We can, however, see a beautiful Milky Way. We, despite the cold, we just stand there in admiration of the universe above us, chatting lightly. After 40 minutes to an hour, I started to feel uneasy. Not really with a reason. Then my friend goes to pee, short distance and remains in sight, and I concentrate on the surroundings. As I'm used to giving credit to my internal voice, check out and read The Gift of Fear, my dudes. So I suddenly start picking up on something. I hear footsteps. Every time the wind goes down, they go silent. But a bit delayed. I can clearly distinguish them as the ice snow crunched under their weight. When the wind picks up in strength, I tell my friend when he comes back. We listen, and he informs it as they are getting progressively closer. We made eye contact, decided we saw enough of stars and didn't want to stay around to find out, and calmly walked to the car, locked the doors, and booked swiftly out of there. We kept check the next day about robberies, etc., but didn't hear anything. I'm still amazed and spooked in how sudden a very calm, peaceful, and overall nice evening almost resulted in a dangerous encounter. A biped trying to sneak up on you doesn't seem friendly. So I have a very strange story that still gives me the heebie-jeebies when I think about it. This was about four to five years ago, around Thanksgiving. I was a senior in high school at the time, and I had a girlfriend that I frequently visited. She lived in the boonies, middle of nowhere, around a small town called Winona with a population of 162. Now, before I start, I will go ahead and say this is very much the middle of nowhere. This is Courage the Cowardly Dog Country, except with a few hills and random forest clusters. Another thing to add is that there have been multiple mutterings from locals of seeing some very strange things out there. Alrighty, here goes. So... It was almost midnight, and my folks were pretty cool with me staying out as long as I said where I was and when I planned on being back home. I had a 45-minute drive on a very quiet, lonely little highway back to my hometown. So I started off, and normally I drove a little over the speed limit, but not too dangerously. I was alone, and that road just always creeped me out. I just always wanted to get the hell home. There was also not much for lunar light on this night, and stars had pretty low visibility. So, I know this was not some sort of odd celestial phenomenon. This road goes through this drawer where water used to flow a long time ago. The road basically clipped down, then back up after a time. I go down it, and I'm listening to the talking head on my phone, on pretty low volume. As I start to take the incline, a light shines on my car, but it's a sort of white green, and it is not coming from in front of me, like an oncoming car, or from behind me, but it's from directly above me. 
the incline steeps more, and I look right up at this bizarre light. I will try to describe it the best way I can. There was a solid ring-shaped dull white light that appeared to be very large enough to fit a Tahoe or something else inside of it. The center of this ring was a light that was shining directly on me as if it were a spotlight. Its color was sort of white green. This whole enigmatic thing was maybe 50 feet above me. I got a look at it for what felt like four to five seconds until I said, what, what the fuck is that? Then this thing promptly took a sharp trajectory up, then sort of flashed away. I was so beyond terrified that I drove about 110 miles an hour back home. I was in a Camaro the rest of the way home. I didn't sleep very much at all that night. I also swear on my mother's grave, I saw the same flying object a year later when I went to go visit a best friend who lived about 20 miles from civilization in the boonies. This time, I was driving out to his house to hang out, and we were going to drink some and bullshit about college. It was around 9.30 p.m., and I had just made it out past the last of the houses I would see for a while until I reached my friends. Anyways, as I'm driving, I look over to my left and see this same fucking light show in the sky, except it's not on me. It's above a tree line. I could barely see an outline of this thing, but I could tell the lights were on the bottom side. I said, Well, hello again, to myself, as the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. My unexplained flying light show then promptly did the same maneuver as it did the first time, up and out and completely vanished. Now, I'm unsure of what I saw. It still freaks me the fuck out to think about it, but I know it happened, and I saw the same thing twice, and thank God it hasn't been a third. We always have neighbors parking by the street in front of our house which we have no problem with since we park on our own driveway. However, once a week, there's a garbage day. We always try to bring out our trash cans to reserve the space. If we missed it and packs of cars already parked there, then we put the trash cans right behind my car, hoping the driver can get a hint. It's always the same car from the same house that we have a problem with. And after putting the trash can by his car once, I was hoping he could kindly park his car forward to give enough space for us. I mean, it's only once a week, for crying out loud. Today, I was very fortunate to bump into this neighbor who parked his car right next to my trash cans. After I took them out and reserved the space, his car completely blocked them. At that time, there were no car parked in front, and he could have just moved up a bit forward, but he chose to park right by our house and our trash. I'm guessing he doesn't want to take extra steps to walk into his house. Lord forbid. After he got off the phone, I kindly asked if he can just move the car a bit forward because it's blocking the trash cans. He challenged, he challenged, asking what time will the garbage truck come and that he will be gone early in the morning. Trying to avoid the arguments at the time that I was relieved to hear his car won't be blocking. But he continued on and said it's public parking and I cannot demand him where to park. I agree, but said... It's just for one day. It's not like I'm asking you to park out on the next street over. 
It's only about three steps of space, dude, he said. I should park my car up on the driveway and get off the car when backing out. Move the trash cans and then get back to the car. Why should I do that? I know there's no law in regards of this and the street is public parking, but really? There was no car when he parked. Why wouldn't he just move it a bit forward? I was in awe of why this would happen. What are the parking etiquette and what else can we try? If things get ugly like my trash really couldn't get picked up. You all, I'm going to add my personal two cents here. I'm sorry. I would have set the trash cans out in the street where he was and then put a note on his car telling the trash people that you had to do that because of that, you know, lame person. Maybe someone might uh, call the cops on him. That's what I would do. Anyway, I want the stories. If you were around and can't remember, roll your mind's eye back to the weeks immediately following September 11, 2001. Everything was America, particularly in the South and definitely in North Carolina, where I lived. There are a large number of military installations there, including a very large army base about an hour from my hometown. Nearly every car had, at minimum, an American flag bumper sticker, and a frightening majority of people thought anyone who had darker skin than a potato chip was a terrorist. Everyone was hypervigilant, and many people took this as an excuse to become overtly interested in the lies of other peoples and neighbors. Sometimes out of concern for their neighbor's safety, sometimes out of concern for their own. I was eight, and I was pretty sure my elementary school wasn't going to be the target of any massive terrorist attack, and neither were my parents. So my brother and I continued to walk to school each day. There was never a problem. We walked to school every day that didn't have totally awful weather for almost all of my grade school experience. My neighborhood even had weekly paved trails, including one that led directly to my elementary school that we always took. I can't remember if it was recent rain flooding the creek beside the trail or just the climate in general, making the bugs come out in full force. But that week, my brother and I had decided to take a different route and walk along the road. This plan went off without a hitch until we were walking home one day, and a big black SUV with tenant windows and giant American flags blocking the view of the back windshield and back seat, which slowly down to a crawl and then abruptly stopped in front of us and rode down the window. The woman inside was blonde, maybe middle age, and wearing large sunglasses that obscured most of her face. It's not safe for you to walk out here, she called to us. My brother responded with something to the effect of, It's fine, we always walk home, we don't live far. That was a mistake. She rode up her window and drove a few feet away before screeching, her tires to a halt, and rapidly reversing back to us while rolling down her window, and she yelled, You spit on my car? I know you did. You spit on my car. You need to get it right now so that I can drive you home to your parents and you can apologize in front of them. I looked at my brother and we both shook our heads no. And I called back, I didn't spit on your car, look at the side. And then she yelled again, get in my car right now so I can take you home. I turned to my brother again and without a word, we took off running into the woods. My heart was thumping in my chest and I never turned back. 
particularly after I heard her car door open and close. We just kept running. We switched back and forth through the streets and woods, taking several different paths, and finally ended up circling back around until we were home. We just sort of shrugged it off as, yeah, that was weird. Until maybe 15 years later, when I told the story to a friend and their eyes grew wide. She was trying to kidnap you too? It's haunted me still to this day. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Mrs. Innerscare, Sugar Spite, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Christy Elias, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for remaining a pillar of support to the Back to Ashes channel. I've always said, without supporters and an audience, I do not have a voice. So thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.